So uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the 84th monthly meeting of the Strongly Sustainable uh, Business Model Group, the community of the Emerging Flourishing Enterprise Institute, I can now say, uh, having had the family meeting with that uh, earlier, um, uh, earlier in the summer, in August specifically. So uh, Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group, uh, been going since 2012. Uh, we're exploring how to enable entrepreneurs and establish businesses to realize enterprises that choose flourishing as their goal, and that's the work of this community. Um, as per the recommendations for the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Committee, the uh, Truth, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, we start our meetings with an acknowledgement of our privilege, which we've generalized given the global nature of our audience. And so wherever we are today, this is sacred land on which each of us are privileged to be. This land that nearby lakes and sea has supported human beings for thousands of years and is rich in history, knowledge, and tradition. We are privileged to be the beneficiaries and stewards of all that has come before on behalf of the seven generations to come and beyond. And we invite you to consider in your place how you honor and respect people's indigenous to your place, including, of course, for many of you, your students. Today, each place around the world is increasingly a home, is increasingly a home for people from across the world, and we're each grateful to have the opportunity to be where we are today. So that's looking at the world very much from a social uh, perspective. I also want to recognize the biophysical place that we're in. Uh, so we're not actually in this building in this photograph, but we're, we're nearby. Normally we are in that building, but we're today in the nearby. Uh, this is Ontario College of Art and Design University in downtown Toronto. That's the CN Tower in the background there. Uh, and so I'd like to ask you, do you know which watershed you're in today? And for those of us in, in this area, we're in uh, at, at the edge of a creek, uh, at the edge of a watershed, in part of a watershed known as Russell's Creek, but, uh, uh, that they and we, our ancestors, buried to become a sewer in the mid 1870s, and so far I've been unable to uh, find an indigenous name for it, although I know it did have one. Uh, so if anybody has any insight into that, might welcome it. And obviously, when we have sessions like this, we are very interdependent with place, specifically, you know, a very concrete example where the sewer connects to is uh, at least partly uh, enabled by the ecosystem service as is provided by that watershed to us as human beings. And if you're using the flourishing business canvas, of course, this is a tool that will allow you to think about things like how the watershed, uh, which is a vital collection of biological stocks and solar power ecosystem services, connects to your business. So uh, the SSBMG, as of uh, earlier on this afternoon, we were just over 1,625 people. We've added about 50 in the last month. Uh, we are the world's first or only group taking action to undertake enterprise strategy and to do organizational design action research from a micro-ecological economic perspective using anticipatory system, systemic design approaches with a strong normative purpose to enable flourishing. So hopefully we get you, we get each other. And what we do as members of the group is we put into practice and undertake action research around the latest thinking, and we offer a global network of possibilities for education, research, and employment. Uh, I won't go through the detailed goals, uh, you can take a look at those offline. This presentation will be put in the folder today uh, with the recording. Um, we are, as I mentioned, uh, evolving the group to become a flourishing enterprise institute, a global planetary wide network of nodes, and an associated research and practice community, some evolution of this group. Um, and uh, the uh, and I've said all of this, so we held Hello Family Forum in August 2019, and there will be more communication about the outcomes from that and next steps, uh, which anybody in the group can engage with as they wish uh, going forward. And part of the reason for today's meeting uh, is that having had conversations with Mauricio, our speakers Mauricio and Colin, uh, over the last three months, uh, we've started to recognize that their organizations and the Flourishing Enterprise Institute um, are doing very, very similar things from different perspectives. And so part of the purpose of this meeting is to have them introduce themselves to our wider community so that we can have a better basis for a conversation about what might we want to do next uh, together. Um, so uh, just as a, a, a note, we are part of a larger movement, which we started to refer to as the Movement for Flourishing Enterprises. And the logos appearing on the screen here are other organizations, projects, groups, books, that seem to talk to what we understand by flourishing enterprise. Not everybody here would self-identify with being in the movement at this point, uh, but we're working on them. Uh, we're also, of course, aligned with the SDGs. Uh, won't say too much about that, but I would also say we're going beyond the, uh, the SDGs. Um, we are taking um, 
uh, we have multiple collaborative initiatives uh, of our members by our members, because we're a completely volunteer-based group at the moment. So we have the uh, Rethinking, Regenerating and Resilience Group R3.0, formerly called Employment 3.0. We've got the Future Fit Business Benchmark Project. We've got the Flourishing Enterprises. Uh, we've got we focus on sustainability, uh, the Flourishing Enterprise Innovation Toolkit, uh, and Aim to Flourish. Uh, and there are other initiatives in the works. Um, we also make and sustain, sustain uh, connections and community. Uh, the first international conference on sustainable entrepreneurship was organized by one of our members of the Belka here, and that just happened in Montreal, and a number of us were that. Uh, there's a published paper talking about the whole field of sustainable business models in both weak and strong sustainable business models. Uh, there's the Systemic Design Network, whose uh, eighth symposium is in October in Chicago. Uh, and Peter Jones, our member, is one of the initiators and leaders of that community. Uh, systemic design being our chosen epistemology, generally speaking. Uh, R3.0, we mentioned them already. The International Conference on New Business Models there. Uh, fifth uh, conference will be in Nijemen, Nijemen in the Netherlands next year. Uh, we've also got uh, the blog, uh, sustainablebusinessmodel.org, and the Institute for Evolutionary Leadership, and the Global Key Corp Academic Movement, as well as the Academy for Sustainable Innovation here in Canada. We've got a whole bunch of things that we've been working on. I won't go through that in any detail. Uh, these are some of the additional things that people are thinking about. Again, won't go through that now. And then we have these monthly meetings. And these monthly meetings are there to now enable our members uh, to share with each other. And uh, here's a selection of recent ones. Uh, you can look at the section of the wiki and all of our monthly meetings are documented there. Most of the ones the last three years recorded and all the slides are available uh, in our Google Drive, uh, which you can link from the wiki. Uh, we'll go through this. So um, I just want to put a, a note out that we are looking for volunteers to help us continue with um, these monthly meetings. So if you know of anybody who would like to volunteer uh, with an opportunity to uh, get on the inside track of this community uh, and deepen your knowledge, um, that would be great. Uh, have them connect with me. We're looking for about a day a month between now and uh, I should say 2020, obviously. Uh, just at 2019, I should say, and then half a day a month to the end of next uh, August. So, on to this month's meeting. Um, I would, I'm absolutely delighted to uh, welcome uh, Carly Costain, the Chair and President of the Centre for Evol Evolutionary Learning, and Mauricio Zolo, who is also on the board of CELL, but is also the Founder and Academic Director of Golden, the Global Organisation, Global Organisational Learning and Development Impact. Uh, and uh, I would uh, welcome you both and uh, hand it over to you. I'll stop sharing my slides. You can uh, share your slides and uh, take us away through uh, an introduction to your work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, I really appreciate uh, you inviting Maurizio and I here. Um, and we're very uh, happy, um, those, those of us from CELL, to be part of the um, FEI uh, network. Uh, it was really serendipitous, I think, that we uh, we connected totally by accident. Um, maybe not not perhaps just by accident a few months ago. Um, so my name is Kali Kostian. Um, I wanted to uh, share some slides with you to uh, introduce you a little bit to um, CELL, uh, which is short for Center for Evolutionary Learning. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen here. Um, and uh, as part of this presentation, I'd like to also, hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, as part of this presentation, I'd like to also, uh, towards the end, uh, walk you through a firsthand experience of how we start our path to individual flourishing, which in our philosophy uh, is a precursor for uh, enterprise or organizational flourishing. Um, and then, uh, you know, I'll, I'll pass it over to uh, Maurizio uh, to add anything you might have to say about uh, CELL and to introduce uh, uh, the Golden uh, Network uh, as well. Um, so, we are um, a global nonprofit network. Uh, we have presence in 44 countries, and we um, essentially um, are a network of professionals dedicated to helping individuals and organizations 
evolved towards ideal models, uh, performance, uh, social responsibility, and uh, very importantly, sustainability, and going to beyond sustainability to, to a flourishing state. Um, so we have worked with a number of corporate and non-corporate clients, uh, starting with very big ones like IBM, Microsoft, HP, and so on. Um, also smaller uh, organizations, small nonprofits, uh, also uh, governmental and either intergovernmental institutions like the government of Bulgaria worked with, uh, European Union, um, and uh, the United Nations. Um, a couple of quotes. So um, this is from a uh, you know a program series that we had at uh, Microsoft, and you see on the quote on the screen the quote from uh, Jean Philippe Courtois about the effectiveness of the uh, meditation programs we had there. Um, so I'll get into this uh, in a couple slides, but um, the methodology of choice for us at Cell. Uh, is meditation through which we engender this individual transformation, which, which then translates to an organizational uh, transformation. Um, in uh, Europe, uh, one of the largest, the largest to date uh, to that point, uh, sustainability uh, project uh, that, that was uh, undertaken at the European level was uh, a project called RESPONSE. And uh, Cell had played a, a very uh, key role uh, with the research it uh, undertook uh, and, and presented it as part of this forum. And this is a quote from the vice president of the uh, European Commission that, that led that uh, effort. Um, we also uh, partner with, with uh, gosh, I forgot to add a very key one there. It goes to tell uh, the, these are not the most recent slides. <clears throat> FEI, of course, um, you know, uh, I will add this, uh, this on the list uh, as soon as we get off the call. Um, so uh, to delve right into it, um, what is the root problem? The root problem is, of course, change. And Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you wish to, to see in the world, uh, meaning the change starts uh, with the individual. Uh, if we want to see a changed world, we have to change ourselves. Uh, now, change is hard. Um, you know, if you take a compass uh, where the needle of the compass is pointing in a certain direction, uh, you can move the needle with your finger to a different direction that you desire, and the needle will stay that way. But as long as you lift your finger, the compass goes back to its original position. Why? Because there's a magnetic field that makes it so. Um, in a similar way, um, when we talk about organizational change, um, what we notice is that the top-down imposed uh, policy changes, uh, mission statement changes, uh, policy updates, and so on, um, tend often to be short-lived. Uh, the organization tends to revert after some time to essentially its DNA, its built-in behaviors and actions. So in other words, the internal compass of the organization, which is composed of individuals, tends to override <clears throat> over time any uh, top-down imposed um, uh, measures. So what we set out to do is to change the magnetic field of the organization so that the compass points to true north uh, always. So there's not a tension between um, the company's values and the behaviors and actions of the employees, but those are in sync. And for that, the transformation starts with uh, the individual. Um, then it percolates to the organization and then it has an effect that we can see um, when there's a critical mass of flourishing organizations, um, it has a systemic impact on the environment and society. So as you can see at the bottom, this change became, began with ourselves, members of CELL. Um, all of us uh, meditate. We have been uh, practicing a certain method of meditation. Um, 
that uh, we noticed in our own lives engendered a very significant transformation uh, in ourselves in changing that um, internal moral compass um, uh, magnetic field, if you will, uh, within ourselves uh, on an energetic level, uh, which in turn uh, changed our uh, mindset, um, our emotions, our ways of thinking, um, our value system. Um, it it uh, sparked in us qualities which are inherent in every human being, but they are normally hidden or clouded, um, and they come alive when um, this inner system is, is turned on, so to speak. And then we got together and we were like, okay, we saw these amazing changes that this oral meditation had on us personally. What would happen if these this, this meditation system were to be practiced by a whole organization? What would happen to that organization? This is how Cell was born. So what is meditation? Um, if, if we take a survey, uh, you know, or even if you look up in, in various dictionaries, you'll see multiple definitions for it. And there's certainly a plethora of meditation systems out, of the, uh, out there. But uh, the definitions fall into two categories. Essentially, there's a, a more Western style uh, notion which revolves uh, around the concept of thought, thinking visualization, contemplation, um, uh, you know, concentration. Um, and then there's another Eastern um, view of meditation, which revolves around the notion of the absence of thought, uh, what we call as thoughtless awareness, um, which of course is a difficult state to achieve. If I tell you, don't think, um, guess what's gonna happen? You're probably gonna, you know, uh, continue to think. Um, so how does it work uh, is um, essentially um, within every human being, there's an inner energy, which resides in the sacred bone, uh, which when awakened, um, it nourishes and heals the physical, mental, emotional aspects of our being. And it puts us into this state of thoughtless awareness. So it rises from the sacred bone along the spine, and it pierces to the top of the head, where you can actually feel it tangibly. So it's not just a story that we tell you, oh, some energy has been awakening you, but you can actually feel it as a very gentle, cool breeze coming out of your head and also in your palms. It's very subtle, but it's there. And it's the beginning of a new dimension in our awareness where we can feel our subtle energy system our three energy channels and seven energy centers on our fingertips, on our palms, on various regions of our hands. And we can, uh, using this new awareness, once this energy is awakened, we can diagnose ourselves. Uh, we can see where the energetic blockages are in which centers. And we can use this energy to clear those blockages out. And these energy centers embody certain human qualities in a very precise way. There's a certain science of, uh, about it, uh, which is ancient actually, but it has been recently uh, made possible to experience by everyone through this very simple natural uh, form of meditation. And so this is how the transformation is engendered. This is how the individual changes. This is how I looked at myself after about a year or two of practicing this and saw that I was a completely different person. A lot of negative stuff had cleared out of my life. And I developed all these qualities um, which were non-existent or very, uh, very weak before. And now they were just blossoming. Um, so uh, this uh, cell has a strong uh, research arm. Um, we have uh, done research spanning, um, you know, medical science, uh, neuroscience, um, you know, business uh, research uh, in, in the academia. And, uh, you know, you can, you can see here a, a big, uh, big title called ADHD. So uh, this energy and this formal meditation that starts with this awakening of this energy that puts you into thoughtless awareness, where you are um, aware, you're alert, 
you're not sleeping or dozing off, but you're not thinking. Um, a very pure type of, of consciousness. This type of meditation um, nourishes the physical body, but also the mental side, uh, your mental acuity and focus and so on, and the emotional balance. Um, it's, it's a holistic approach, essentially. Um, so I'm, ju I'm just going to kind of run quickly through these slides, uh, showing some, um, you know, brain uh, research uh, that basically show that long-term effects of uh, this practice of meditation based on thoughtless awareness. So again, I'm not talking about any type of meditation out there. There's, you know, mindfulness, which is based on, you know, visualization, uh, concentration, and so on. It can take you up to a certain point in training your attention, but then it stops there. Um, you know, there's relaxation, there's all kinds of things out there, uh, but this actually takes you into measurable impact uh, on the brain, on various organs, uh, and so on, as well as uh, positively modified business uh, mindset and behaviors. Um, so this slide is about uh, uh, certain research done uh, showing how uh, thoughtless awareness uh, increases the density of, of gray matter, sustained attention, self-control, and, and empathy, things which are quite difficult to achieve otherwise. Um, also, as I was mentioning just a couple sentences earlier, it improves the quality of and the sustainability of business decisions. So we took uh, a group of managers and we administered questionnaires uh, pre and post meditation, and we observed that after the meditation, um, there was a clear bias of the responses towards more sustainable uh, decisions. And sustainability here it goes uh, basically to the core of, of the flourishing uh, definition, which is, uh, as John Ehrenfeld explained in his, in his book, Flourishing, um, it's about achieving our full potential in a way that benefits all stakeholders, uh, the individual, the corporation, uh, the investors, the partners, uh, customers, um, uh, you know, and, and society and the, the natural environment uh, as well, uh, long term, uh, indefinitely. Um, so uh, we have um, extended in cell uh, Maslow's hierarchy of um, needs, which you can see at the bottom in a simplified form, uh, we have added an inverted pyramid on top um, where um, one, one critical aspect that develops as you practice this type of meditation is um, collective consciousness. So what collective consciousness means um, for us is a very precise term. It means the ability to feel yourself and others on your central nervous system. Um, so um, our senses are connected to our central nervous system. That's why everybody agrees that the sky is blue, the fire is hot, the honey is sweet, and so on, because these senses are absolute because they're connected to our central nervous system. By contrast, our thinking, which comes from the two hemispheres of the brain, uh, is relative. Uh, everybody has a different conception about the world because um, it's not connected to a central nervous system. So uh, the sense that I was telling you about before, once this energy is awakened, you can feel on your palms, the state of your soul system, that is connected to the central nervous system. So it is absolute in a way. And you can also feel those centers on somebody else, on a group of individuals. You are aware of what are the problems on a fundamental energetic level which goes beyond the surface of, oh, this is kind of an aggressive uh, group, or uh, there's a lot of inertia in this group, or whatever the, uh, the problem, the imbalance might be there, uh, it gets decoded into um, a, a fundamental building blocks on the energetic level. And that's something that you as an individual uh, and the group becomes aware of, and then can use this uh, energy to correct those imbalances. So it starts with know thyself, where you, you diagnose, and then you master yourself, you correct yourself, you bring yourself into the state of balance. Collective consciousness, awareness of the group, then organizational flourishing, the transformation of the organization, um, which has two dimensions that I'll, I'll explain in, in a moment. And then once we, a critical mass of 
such flourishing organizations will hopefully exist. Uh, I don't know if in our lifetime we'll see it or not, but then we'll have systemic uh, flourishing. Um, we have three programs. I'm not going to go into great details in, into them, but uh, the I leap, the individual leap, is about is about uh, mostly the individual uh, transformation, learning how to meditate, uh, diagnose yourself, uh, improve yourself, perfect yourself, and develop this uh, collective consciousness uh, that has uh, essentially is tied to the organization uh, as well in the line with the company uh, vision and, and values. The sign leader is more for um, uh, you know, uh, application of, of this new awareness and evolution uh, to uh, leaders and managers of teams and uh, executives who manage uh, organizations and, and how to apply uh, enlightened decision-making uh, to day-to-day uh, to -day, uh, business uh, leading activities. And the third one is a flourishing organization, which... <clears throat> um, as I mentioned briefly before, um, it's basically uh, goes on two parallel uh, dimensions. Um, one of them is has to do with with sustainable development according to the the goals of the organization. You see it on the right side of the of the slide. Uh, it's its main component, and the other one on the left side is reflective development, which has to do with this. Uh, new uh, dimension of awareness, which is developed through uh, meditation. Um, so we identified through a number of discussions we had with Anthony and uh, Randy and, and, and Harvey and others uh, in FEI, uh, a number of uh, strong uh, potential uh, you know, ways that, that we could collaborate. Um, I've listed here uh, a few of them, you know, just to, you know, kind of provide a, a starting point. Uh, and we feel that there's a very strong uh, complementarity uh, between FEI and, uh, uh, and CELL, especially because we have uh, done a lot of work and we have a lot of research, um, especially in the field of individual flourishing. Um, we have not uh, had uh, yet the opportunity to study a client over a long period of time, over years, to see uh, their evolution to flourishing. Uh, so, so systemic organizational flourishing um, is something that we are uh, very much eager to embark on. And uh, it's my understanding that with FEI, it's, it's kind of the opposite, um, where the, the focus is more on, uh, you know, uh, enterprise organizational flourishing, um, but there's not so much uh, emphasis on the uh, individual flourishing part. So a very strong com complementarity there. Um, we've we've uh, um, published a book uh, in 2017 uh, through uh, Greenleaf, which is now uh, Routledge, um, the evolutionary leap to uh, flourishing individuals and organizations where we, uh, we go into the details of how it works, uh, what are the uh, three channels of energy and seven centers of energy, what are the qualities, uh, how do they manifest, uh, what are the opposite dimensions, blockages, if you will, uh, how to clear them and bring them into balance, and how does that reflect on the organization, what's our underlying research on it, and the case studies from the clients that we work on, um, you know, how various pieces of the puzzle fit together, uh, essentially. Uh, and this was written by, by the whole uh, board of CELL. Uh, so about uh, six of us are, are all co-authors on it. Um, so um, at this point, we'll, I'm gonna, you know, pause and ask for, for any questions that may be there uh, in the room uh, before we uh, proceed with a guided meditation, if you'd like to, I try it out. It only takes about uh, 10 minutes and, uh, you know, hopefully you'll be able to, um, you know, feel the uh, uh, inner peace and uh, the cool breeze in your hands and above your head. Like I said, it's very gentle. Um, and hopefully, uh, you know, maybe even just a, a few seconds or maybe more of thoughtless awareness um, so that you can get a firsthand experience of, of what this is. So let me, uh, let me take a moment here and, uh, you know, open up for 
any questions you may have. I, I'm, I'm, I, I haven't set this up ahead of time, so I'll just sort of build it on my head. I'm curious here, uh, who has any experience of meditation at all of any kind? Am I just going to show of hands? On Dean, I know you put your hand up. And that was that your hand? Yes. No, that's a curtain. <laughs> okay, so so maybe about maybe about half of us. Um, and who, who would um, describe themselves as a? I'm not quite sure what the right word is. Seasoned meditator. We've got Harvey. Anybody else? Colin, would you put your hand up for that or or, or not? No, I think that would help if people can hear me. Um, Carlo, would you put your hand up as an experienced meditator or, or not? Yes, absolutely. I mean, Maurizio and I have been meditating for over 25 years and uh, we know each other for, for about that, that long. And uh, we meditate every day. And, uh, uh, you know, I just wanted to say it's, uh, it's so heartening that meditation has actually become a mainstream thing, you know, because it used to be uh, maybe 10 years ago, it would be like, kind of a weird new age type of thing out there. But then research started to come out and it's like, hey, this is real. This actually changes you. It's not just a bunch of hippies, you know, uh, who, uh, you know, are having a nice, nice dream about something. So, uh, yeah. I, I have a question. Um, sure. um, so, so I'm very involved in the mindfulness movement. Well, I guess as a mindfulness practitioner, and um, I, I don't think I've ever experienced thoughtless awareness. Um, and so what really draws me into mindfulness practice is the fact that one can accept that the mind is constantly generating thoughts, like 24 seven, seven days a week, 350, you know, 65 days of the year. So it's a constant stream. That's part of the brain's mechanism is to generate thoughts. And it's about how you can choose to engage with those thoughts um, that make, you know, have had a profound impact on my life. And obviously um, those that I've seen as uh, mindfulness meditators. So I'm just very curious about thoughtful, thoughtless awareness because it's not something that I've ever experienced as a meditator. It is a new concept. Um, and and uh, you're right. I mean, there are many types of meditation out there um, which are based on the, on the concept of thought. And thoughtless awareness is something that's, that is new. Um, the reason why it's so difficult to achieve is because the um, energy that causes thoughts to elongate has not been awakened. So this energy which is awakened through uh, this type of meditation is a game changer. Because what it does is our thoughts come from the two hemispheres of the brain. And so uh, this energy, and in the middle there's a point of consciousness where these thoughts actually come into our attention. Um, this energy, when it rises, it pushes the thoughts aside and it slows down the, the, the thinking process. And so the thoughts actually, which appear to us to be continuous, they're actually discrete. They rise and fall down and another thought rises and falls down and so on. Very quick succession. But if you reduce the intensity and the frequency of these thoughts, eventually you get to a point where there's a space between two consecutive thoughts where there's nothing in between. And that is thoughtless awareness. And with practice, you are able to uh, increase this distance to, from a fraction of a second, maybe to a few seconds, to, you know, a minute, you know, a minutes, you know, more than a minute at a time. And um, it is really very hard to describe. Um, but it is the epitome of peace, I would say, because uh, stress comes from our thoughts, uh, ultimately. If there's no thought in your mind, then there's nothing to cause tension. It, it is automatically 
you get this, uh, this sensation of peace and relaxation in your body in those moments of thoughtless awareness, those precious ones. And so, um, and then you get a feeling of, of very subtle joy, which is not excitement. It just comes from this peace, like satisfaction, you can say. Um, and all the techniques that we uh, learn and practice are to facilitate this state of thoughtless awareness by removing the obstacles, removing the blockages in the centers that cause all this constant mental activity, which, as you rightly pointed out, uh, we have gotten used to. So it's kind of uh, stopping our mind is, uh, uh, is unusual and it's hard, uh, but this energy makes it possible. This is a game changer. Any other questions in the room? Always go on. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a, a comment related to what you just talked about, uh, Kaleen. Is um, what in Zen in the Zen practice I do, or inside Zen practice, we don't talk about thoughtless awareness, but pretty much the practice is uh, what you described. Um, it is pretty much aiming towards a state where you're free from thought. Although thoughts, as you're saying, are always arising. But one of the kind of, I, I think one of the methods that help to bring that about is about opening up our, um, our, our different senses. So, you know, we practice, let's say, 360 degree awareness, meaning really opening up the senses of seeing, particularly of hearing, uh, of feeling, you know, to all those senses so that instead of the mind being so preoccupied with the thoughts arising, the, the mind learns to be present to what is in the, in, the, in the moment. So you start to hear things that you might not necessarily have heard, you know, the breeze outside, the trees, the birds, the kind of things that you're, and, and by opening up your awareness in that way, uh, it tends to um, create that uh, space between the thoughts. So I'm, I'm curious if, if that sort of resonates with you. It uh, totally or, resonates, uh, Harvey, yes. Uh, and in fact, Zen is indeed, as you said, based on thoughtless awareness. The only thing is that uh, there's not a specific uh, knowledge or practice focused on the awakening of this uh, inner energy. Uh, but, the, but the thoughtless awareness is indeed the, um, uh, the goal. Uh, the koans, for example, the questions which don't have uh, a logical answer, are meant to put the uh, listener into thoughtless awareness because there is no logical answer, right? So it's supposed to stun your mind and stop your thoughts for a moment. The Zen gardens with those beautiful part patterns are meant to put you into thoughtless awareness. And what you said about the sense is also very true. There's a very uh, you know, clear connection there. When you are in thoughtless awareness, um, so I, I can see where you're coming from. You're coming from, okay, let's uh, increase the acuity of the senses. Let me pay attention to those birds chirping. And then I can get away from my thoughts. But the, the uh, opposite is also true. When you are in thoughtless awareness, your senses, uh, acuity, the acuity of your senses becomes uh, so much clearer and stronger. And all of a sudden, it's, you can feel the silence and you can hear those birds, uh, which you, can, you were not hearing before, because now there's silence in you. And so thoughtless awareness is a very deep um, uh, state of silence, uh, silence of, of thought. Um, and there's one more thing that you mentioned, which is completely uh, on the dot, which is you talked about being in the moment at one, one point. And that is exactly what the state of meditation is actually. Because our thoughts come from the two hemispheres, from the left and the right. The thoughts from the future come from the left hemisphere. The thoughts from the past come from the right hemisphere. And in the present moment, there's no thought. That is a state of thoughtless awareness. So this inner energy takes you into the center, which is a present moment, which is silence, devoid of thoughts. I just wanted to um, uh, make one uh, sort of big picture observation here, which I, I find 
really fascinating about this whole uh, uh, this whole situation that we find ourselves in, which is that um, we're trying we're we're all trying to describe an experience from our internal perspective. It's a, a first person report of what we've experienced, and of course our language is designed for interaction, so it inherently involves at least one other person, even when we're only talking to ourselves. And so being able to translate a first-person experience into language is very, very challenging. And then, yes. of course, as most of us have you know, a Western education, and many of us are, uh, are, are formal researchers you know, using the scientific method, which has had you know, 100 and, well, you could, you could argue it may be 200 years of denying the validity of first-person reports as, as a source of evidence. And so uh, I know for myself, I, I, when I first started to become aware of this um, meditation uh, specifically, I was extremely skeptical because of this challenge. And then I started to realize that the source of my skepticism was actually to do with the, um, uh, the norms in, in society that I've been brought up with, not necessarily the uh, anything else, and so that, that's one of the things that's allowed me to become open to hearing this quite different from a historical Western perspective set of ideas, uh, and and to start to see, and, and then to see people like Mauricio himself uh, reporting on neuroscience, which is you know third-person reports of this first-person experience that where there seems to now be um, some correlates between. Uh, between what's been reported in the first person and, and what's been observed in the third. So I just wanted to, to throw that in. Um, are, are we up to, to try this uh, experience? Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, we are in the room online. Uh, you, you up for this? Yeah, we got a, a thumbs up. <laughs> All Michael, right. you're always so Let's I'll, I'll say yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to sit in our chairs uh, comfortably, but with our back straight, so without slouching. So let's keep our back uh, vertical and our feet on the floor, um, apart from each other, you know, soles uh, flat on the floor. And uh, we're gonna uh, put our hands on our lap uh, with the palms fully open. So our fingers should be straight. I don't think the picture has fingers which are very straight, but our fingers should be straight and uh, fully open without, you know, we're not gonna touch the thumb and the index or anything, just straight, straight out fingers. Um, okay, and um, what we're gonna do is, um, I'm gonna basically walk you through a few places where we're gonna place our right hand. So left hand is always stationary on our lap. And the right hand, um, first we're gonna put it uh, on our heart. Okay. We're gonna do this with, with our eyes closed because it's easier to you know, keep our attention inside. It, it helps the energy to rise. Uh, then we're gonna put it uh, on our forehead as we do sometimes when we have a headache. So we can all do it now as a practice uh, before we close our eyes and, and do it for real. Um, and then we're going to take the hand, we're going to stretch our fingers and we're going to put the center of the palm on the top of the head with our fingers fully straight so that only the center of the palm is in contact with our head. So not like this, but like this, yes. Um, and here we're going to massage, we're going to move, press hard and move the scalp uh, clockwise seven times. That's what we're going to do. Uh, and then we're going to keep our attention on the top of the head. So um, let's close our attention. Uh, let's close our uh, eyes now, if you prefer. Uh, if you don't like it, you can keep them open. It's up to you. But we found that keeping the eyes closed uh, helps eliminate external distractions. And we can keep our hands flat open with the palm up, palms upwards on our knees, on our lap. And we can take a few slow, deep breaths to just calm ourselves down, 
slow down our thought process. And just be pleasantly placed toward ourselves. Now let's put the right hand on our heart. We're going to say uh, a few affirmations uh, to invoke the qualities of these energy centers and help the energy to rise. So here we can say in our heart, I am the pure self, meaning I'm not this body, the mind, thoughts, or emotions, but the self, the pure self. Or alternatively, we can say, if you prefer, I am true to myself. I can say this not aloud, but just inside, silently, a few times. I am the pure self, or if you'd like, I am true to myself. Now let's take our hand on our forehead. Here, this center gets constricted if we think too much about the past, if we hold grudges, if we don't forgive, if we allow any negative thoughts to come to our mind. So to open this center, we're going to say inside to ourselves from our heart, I forgive everyone. And I also forgive myself. Without thinking of anyone in particular, just letting go of the past. Just forgiving everyone and everything in general. Let's say several times from our heart, I forgive everyone and I also forgive myself. I forgive everyone and I also forgive myself. Now let's stretch our fingers fully and put the center of our palm at the top of the head press down hard and rotate the scalp clockwise. And at every circle, let's say, let me be in the state of meditation. 
seven times. We make seven circles. Slowly. And then we can slowly bring our hand back on our lap, palm upwards. But let's continue to keep our eyes closed and our attention on top of the head for a few moments. Let us try not to think of the past or the future, <clears throat> but be in the present moment where there's no thought. And just gently putting our attention on top of the head will help us be in the present moment in silence. If any thoughts start coming, we can just say, I forgive, I forgive. And the thoughts will dissipate and go away. And then we can bring our attention again to the top of the head in the present moment without thought. Now we can uh, slowly open our eyes and we can um, put our left hand or we can keep them closed if you want, um, above the top of the head, uh, not touching the head, but maybe six to 12 inches uh, away from the head um, and bend your head forward 
and C, I don't know if you have AC or not blowing where you are, but um, see if you can feel a very gentle, cool breeze coming out of the fountain airborne area, the very top of your head, uh, straight up into the center of your palm. Some people feel it pretty far. So again, my suggestion is to keep your hand far away. Don't keep it too close. See if you can find a spot where you can feel it best. Okay, now let's try with the right hand. We can put the left hand on our lap. See if we can feel it with the right hand. See how far away you can feel it. That's why uh, this top of the head bone is called the fontanel bone area, which means little fountain, because in the ancient times, they knew that there's a little fountain of coolness that comes out of there when this energy gets awakened. Okay. So uh, how many of you have felt, uh, oh, you can also put your hands out like this and see if you can feel, um, you know, coolness in your palms. Uh, you might also feel um, sensations of tingling or heat in some of the fingers or palms. These are all indications that this energy gives you about the state of your solar system, where are the blockages, which parts are clear and so on. But that's another discussion. I just wanted to find out uh, how many of you have um, felt something in your hands, uh, whether coolness or, or tingling. Um, either left or right hand, if maybe we can have a ra raise of hands. All right. Um, anybody who has not felt or is not sure if they have not felt? Okay. So the person who raised your hand, can you try to feel next to... Uh, your, your, your neighbor next to you, uh, can you try to feel above their head? Did you feel that? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, so if you didn't feel that. Maybe one at a time. Yeah, I, I can feel something. I can did, you, did you feel something above Anthony's head? Yeah. Okay. Now, can you try again? Can you try again above your own head? And sometimes our mind plays tricks with us, you know, and then it's, you know, you feel that, you know, it's more objective if I feel it above somebody else's head and then you know what to look for. And then you, uh, you know, try to see if you can feel the same sensation above your own head. So you felt the coolness, uh, Anthony, Anthony, above your head? I, I, I felt it um, more strongly on Stephen than I did on myself, but I, I did feel it on myself originally, just a little bit. Both hands equally or one cooler than the other? More, more my left than my right. Okay. So I won't get into the interpretation of this, but there's a whole science about what does this mean if it's left is cooler, right is cooler, all that. Um, so um, that's... Uh, that's basically what I wanted to, uh, to show you today. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if uh, anybody has felt uh, thoughtless awareness, meaning your mind stopped, no thought, even for a short period of time, maybe seconds or maybe even less than a second. Has anybody felt that? Yeah. Okay, great. Did it feel peaceful? Did, did it make you feel more relaxed in those few precious moments? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Great. Well, um, thank you. I'll, I'll just say that, that, that felt quite different from other times that people have tried to guide me through um, other types of meditation. So thank you, Colin. That was very interesting. My pleasure. It's a pleasure to share this with, with as many as possible. And uh, um, so um, there's more information at our website, evolutionary-learning.org. And uh, I just wanted to, uh, you know, turn it over to uh, uh, you, Anthony, and, and Maurizio, uh, you know, to uh, uh, proceed about, uh, you know, learning about Golden. Um, you know, unless Maurizio has more to add about Cell. Uh, so, Maurizio, are you there? It looks like you're still meditating, perhaps. It's also very late at night, Mauricio. Mauricio? Yes. <laughs> it is a test there of attention. Yes. It, Mauricio, are you there? No. Are okay. you there? You're on mute. You have to unmute yourself. You need to unmute yourself. And, and Morris, I, I know you're, you're, uh, you're having the opposite problem, that it's extremely early in the morning for you. So uh, uh, I appreciate it. Morris is joining us from... Uh, you you're back in Australia, Morris? No, no. Um, I'm in London, which is... Um, no, but Mar our colleague uh, Morris is in Australia. Uh, Rizio, uh, over to you. If you'd like to share your slides, I know you have a few. Uh, let me just... Uh, yeah. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, after coming after uh, this experience, obviously we're going to shift gears and, you know, to some extent... Uh, uh, shift back to a normal normal uh, uh, state of mind <laughs> um, we um, wanted to kind of uh, um, uh, couple the uh, presentation of cell and golden uh, because as you will see there are um, uh, clear um, synergies between between the various uh between the, the individual level um uh evolution if you want or or change uh in in uh, uh state of uh consciousness and uh the uh, uh also the change the evolution uh at the organizational level um, so Golden is uh, essentially a community, a global community of uh, uh, academics, uh, and consultants as well, but uh, fundamentally these are, um, it's about 150 uh, research-oriented research academics primarily uh, with uh, companies and institutions and NGOs that have uh, collaborated in a number of projects over the years. Um, the uh, uh, challenge that uh, Golden is trying to contribute is well known to, to, to all of you, right? It's the uh, uh, challenge to, to uh, uh, facilitate the evolution of uh, the entire ecosystem, right? Where obviously corporations play a central role, but are not the only ones. Uh, you know, there are uh, you know, financial institutions, governments, communities, and even social enterprise, hybrid enterprises. Um, and uh, the evolution obviously aims at the, uh, uh, fundamentally at the improvement of the quality of life, if you want, in, in communities. Uh, but the problem is that the uh, various actors not only have to uh, radically uh, redesign uh, uh, their own uh, purpose, but they also need to uh, learn how to engage much more effectively uh, among themselves. Right. So the uh, uh, way in which we have um, been uh, tackling this is by, uh, first of all, uh, linking uh, the uh, business 
um, knowledge, if you want, uh, with um, uh, other uh, expertise, other pockets of expertise in different disciplines that have to do with either with the, the global challenges, right? If you want the SDGs, uh, or with uh, uh, sector, uh, you know, industrial economic sectors from a, also a technical perspective. So just this is just an example in, at Imperial College where I am. Uh, we've been uh, we've developed a, a network of about 15 research centers. Um, you know, literally from all the various um, you know natural sciences, uh, engineering, uh, medical sciences, neurosciences, and uh, all interested in this uh, transition uh, issue towards. Uh, you know, uh, more uh, sustainable and flourishing uh, ecosystems. And with each, there has been, uh, you know, we are, we are building uh, collaborations on essentially uh, leveraging uh, one of the two um, uh, resources, assets that uh, the uh, uh, Leonardo Center, which is the business center that I'm directing, uh, has uh, developed one that has to do with uh, uh, data sets, uh, digital data sets on sustainability and what basically on, on corporate behavior related to sustainability. And the other one is uh, a process of uh, uh, collaborative learning and experimentation. Um, de facto, therefore, there are, there's been uh, now the uh, uh, possibility to leverage both an internal uh, network of expertise on uh, the transition towards flourishing uh, organizations, uh, as well as an external network of expertise, which has uh, been able to uh, that which you know was developed uh, even before I moved uh, to Imperial uh, College. Now, the uh, um, way that we are looking at the the uh, response to this is essentially by uh, uh, putting together uh, an engagement process with companies to start from the uh, uh, exploration of the status quo, understanding the uh, um, uh, impact of what has already been done, right? The, the sustainability initiatives uh, that companies have already uh, put in place. Um, but uh, then clearly uh, uh, shift towards also the uh, exploration and experimentation of uh, alternative ways to uh, manage this, this uh, uh, transition process uh, across all the various functions of the organization. Uh, I'm seeing things that I'm sure you know, most of you are um, quite aware of. The uh, uh, difference perhaps is that the uh, this exploration and experimentation has also uh, taken the uh, uh, individual uh, as the uh, center of attention, uh, not just the process or the structure uh, of the organization. And that's where, for instance, we have collaborated with uh, the Center for Evolutionary Learning. Um, by when when we've designed, for instance, uh, uh, randomized controlled trials, experiments uh, that aiming to uh, understand the relative effectiveness of different um, types of <coughs> learning interventions, and uh, those those um, learning interventions are not only uh, of meditative. Uh, kind, there were a, a number of others. This, first of all, the standard 
learning processes in classrooms. Um, but we also tested, for instance, uh, uh, brain, uh, brain training uh, methodology. So uh, exercises developed by, by uh, uh, neuroscientists to, for instance, lengthen the uh, time horizon um, in our uh, decision making. And, uh, you know, if you want, you know, we'll, we'll go, um, you know, I can go a bit more, more in depth on, on some of these experiments, but uh, uh, essentially the, uh, the evidence uh, shows both from, from uh, a behavioral perspective, so looking at the decision making uh, before and after the uh, uh, learning interventions as well as the uh, psychological traits, right, the antecedent to this decisions, and even the uh, uh, density of the uh, uh, gray matter in specific areas of the brain related to our capacity to control uh, both cognitive and emotional processes. That obviously are areas that are critical in, our, in the sustainability of our uh, decision-making process. Huh? Um, all of those uh, aspects of individuals have uh, been shown to be uh, significantly enhanced through meditative practice rather than all the other uh, alternative um, uh, learning processes, which are somewhat surprising actually, I mean, particularly the, the extent to which all of this has taken place. The, the uh, experiential uh, parts um, are, consists of a number of um, uh, processes of, of learning, also executive education, that, that includes, integrates again, both the individual uh, consciousness development process, as well as the organizational uh, change, you know, uh, stakeholder consultation, uh, reformulation of the corporate process, purpose, and then uh, redefinition of the uh, um, action plan for, for uh, um, achieving the uh, uh, sustainable or the flourishing state. Um, now, all of this, as I was saying, uh, center, centered on the uh, synergistic interdependence between the uh, evidence uh, coming from a digital data set and, uh, and these uh, collabs, right, basically experiential, action-oriented, uh, collective learning uh, processes. Um, I don't want to kind of belabor uh, too much the, the, the theoretical aspects, but essentially the novelty here lies in the fact of having a, a very large and fine-grained understanding of the type of uh, sustainability-related initiative, so that the behavior uh, that, that companies have uh, put in place to respond to the systemic challenges, uh, and looking at the uh, impact on both financial performance and, and uh, sustainability performance at the firm level. And we are in the process of uh, uh, developing um, also uh, the direct uh, initiative level um, impacts, understanding basically what are the impacts. And notice that, that companies announce the, their behavior in their sustainability reports, but they don't announce really in a systematic basis the, the impact, the, the consequences of, of their initiatives, and the reputational aspects, uh, consequences of, um, of, the, of, their, uh, of, the, of these behavior. So conceptually, this is the, uh, the theoretical framework that has been uh, studied with the uh, support of a uh, uh, unique uh, digital data set. It's about 5 million uh, sustainability initiatives that have been uh, collected through a, a combined 
the combined use of uh, uh, several algorithms to scrape the internet to collect all the sustainability reports. And then within each report, this has been done with uh, th 13,000 uh, organizations, essentially all the companies that uh, report uh, on the uh, GRI standards, right? The, the Global uh, Responsible Reporting Initiative. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, uh, not only the identification of those initiatives, uh, or automatized, obviously, within each report, but the uh, um, categorization uh, in terms of the uh, SDGs that uh, are, um, you know, uh, motivating those, uh, those initiatives, and the uh, characteristics, the type of activity uh, that, that um, those initiatives undertake, right? So essentially, we have the possibility to um, assess for, say, uh, each um, uh, SDG, what are the type of activities, the type of initiatives that seem that have statistically a, a better impact on both financial and uh, stakeholder uh, perception, financial performance and stakeholder uh, perceptions, just to give you uh, a sense. And this just gives you a bit more on the uh, um, characteristics of the digital uh, data sets. By the way, this is something that might be of interest for the uh, community uh, of uh, uh, the Flourishing Enterprise um, Institute um, in case there is an interest of uh, um, you know, uh, engaging the clients uh, on the basis of an unviable, you know, a, a unique uh, uh, you know, uh, information basis, right? So we could develop tailored reports for companies, for sectors, even for countries, depending on the type of uh, uh, objectives of, that the client, that the company might, uh, might have, might be interested in, uh, the themes, the, the uh, challenges that they want to tackle. Uh, we could benchmark, obviously, uh, their own behavior, their own initiatives vis-a-vis -vis others, you know, those of their competitors. We can look at the uh, performance implications of the type of initiative that they are undertaking, and therefore this could be the basis for an improved uh, strategic um, uh, design of future um, sustainability uh, uh, strategies, right? Um, so that uh, the uh, um, design the, the the evolution of the of the organization is enhanced right towards uh, towards a flourishing state um, I want to kind of end basically just by giving you the sense of the other uh, component of what golden uh, tries to to to, uh, to uh, uh, leverage right in order to engage companies in this uh, as I said, action-oriented uh, learning. Essentially, these are journeys that are collective, first of all, right? So there's groups of uh, 10, 15 companies with a, a membership base, right? Um, membership uh, fee uh, as well. Uh, there are a number of, uh, let's say, about four um, uh, workshops per year that are uh, designed collaboratively uh, with them and that leverage of course the expertise both internal expertise and, and external uh, expertise of the two communities that I was talking about before but the important thing is that uh, you know, it's, you know, companies are have the opportunity to uh, first of all prepare for this workshop by uh, learning how to assess the impact of their what they've done, um, but during the workshops uh, and more importantly after the workshop, <laughs> they are uh, 
also have the opportunity to go to uh, you know deep dives with uh, with us um, either in individual projects or with uh, um, learning uh, programs, executive education essentially, where uh, they can uh, they learn how to uh, not only engage uh, stakeholders, assess um, how they can create value for the stakeholders, but more importantly, uh, develop the action plan, rethink the purpose of the firm, develop the action plan, and test uh, with you know, experimental designs, test you know, what it would be like, for instance, to uh, um, you know, integrate uh, stakeholder representatives in their governance or in their, uh, or their interest in incentive systems, control systems, and so on, and also tests the effectiveness of uh, uh, interventions to develop uh, sustainability mindsets, as I was saying before. So essentially, this, this becomes, again, uh, all of this, by the way, leverages, of course, the data uh, sets and uh, produces data, additional data, uh, for instance, on the impact of individual initiatives. Uh, that uh, enriches the uh, the data set as well, and all of that uh, uh, you know aims to to uh, uh, facilitate the uh, speed up, but more importantly improve the the direction uh, and the quality of the evolutionary processes uh, towards um, towards you know flourishing uh, states at the individual as well as the organizational level. That's that's what I wanted to say in in a real uh, nutshell. I, you know, given that <laughs> we've been already on online for a while, I thought uh, don't uh, want to much time. Do you have questions, or comments? Uh, so, um, I, 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 Morris and I were just having a, a chat in the background, uh, and uh, and then you actually said what we were chatting about, which, uh, which is the uh, the idea that uh, some of those data sets could be of interest to to people here. Uh, so uh, I, I think Morris will be reaching out to you and uh, starting a, a conversation to learn a little bit more about that. So uh, expect uh, Chris to uh, to do that. Um, does anybody else have any other uh, questions or or thoughts? I know I've got a couple. So while other people are pondering, maybe Peter. Oh. Sure. Uh, where do you see the possible integration of a flourishing business model approach in that type of stakeholder engagement if you're working directly with an organization? I mean, is that, uh, is, is, is that something that could be worked into, you know, that series of, of engagements or is this more, cro or do you foresee the process as being more cross organizational in which case you know, a an action plan might not result in a business model as part of, as part right. of the action. Um, what we're trying to do is actually to blend the the two the two advantages, right? The the collective learning with the uh, individual organizational learning. Um, we think that the uh, collab uh, formula is. Uh, very useful as a, uh, an introduction, right? As, as a soft entry uh, for uh, organizations who might not have necessarily clear ideas of what they really need and what they really want to do. Um, the uh, particularly, you know, uh, at least our experience has been with, with gold and that you know, if we go in and start talking about um, you know uh, rethinking the purpose of the organization and uh, experiment with uh, different governance uh, models and incentive systems and things of that sort, uh, that becomes um, recognized as yeah, it's very interesting, but also very risky and very. Um, very much, you know, um, you know, nice, nice to see, but you know, perhaps 
perhaps uh, not now <laughs> kind of response. Well, that's why I wondered uh, if you had a staged approach to yes, where going from that, a challenge is, to the implementation. Exactly. We have very, in fact, we call it collaboratories. This is the Christakis yeah, approach. Yeah. It's very, very similar, similar in its organization. Yeah. And, and, uh, and the collaboratory has the advantage that, uh, you know, it, it gives, it has a soft entry for everyone and then gives the organization the, the freedom, the, the opportunity to decide when and how and, uh, you know, on, on what themes to actually do a, eventually a deep dive in, uh, you know, real experimentation, real uh, organizational uh, change processes, right? Um, the other thing also, you know, with the use of uh, executive education packages, right, programs, where the, uh, the experimentation uh, comes at the end of uh, uh, an exploration uh, process with stakeholders. Uh, getting managers, even senior managers, to uh, engage, to actually ask questions to stakeholders, to understand what are their expectations and how the company can create value for them and what kind of value uh, is particularly fruitful. And that opens up the, the opportunity to rethink some of the foundations uh, and then eventually experiment in uh in you know in executing uh those those foundational changes but you know um yeah that 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 is the the balanced the uh, approach doing only collabs doesn't allow uh companies necessarily to go to the level of depth that is required in order to move rapidly towards flourishing states no, they're encounters, yeah, as, or as like, yeah. as Daniel Roby's model of encounters and episodes, you, especially over multiple years, you would have, you know, the encounter sessions as collabs or as, as, um, as cross-stakeholder engagements that could be used for inspiring and, and learning development within organizations, but also each company or each group is going to have its own tempo and pace for the integration of that learning and its own developmental curve that may take time. I would think that the way of looking at this, the way I look at it, we have a number of different approaches to discovery, but we often use visioning and strategic foresight, mm -hmm. but appropriate to the type of organization. And there may be many different ways you need to introduce the opportunities and learning yeah. early in the stage for that discovery and exploration before they're even ready for it taking on significant change. Yep. So um, uh, we, we are actually out of time officially. So uh, I know there are still a few questions. Uh, so uh, just to, wanted to recognize that if people do need to leave, uh, that's quite okay. And also recognizing it's rather late at night for Maurizio and uh, uh, don't want to keep him beyond uh, our time too much. Uh, but uh, I will now draw the formal part of the meeting to, to a close and uh, stop recording. But if anybody wants to, Stay to ask questions, that, that's fine. Um, Mauricio, uh, Colin, really appreciate you joining us today uh, for giving us some initial perspective and sharing uh, both the Center for Evolutionary Learning and also Golden, and uh, clearly see the, you know, the overlaps that we first started to observe when we first started talking at, at, at coming clearer and clearer to me. So we're uh, looking forward to some next steps to explore how we, um, can start to integrate and leverage and you know, all of those words for our for, for moving forward towards the collective goal that we share, which is enabling the possibility of learning. <laughs> really, uh, thank you, really, Anthony. So thank, thank you. you. It's very been exciting and here, and uh, obviously we look forward to uh, next uh, next steps. Uh, but it's very very clear to us as well that there are obvious synergies and obvious ways to. Uh, you know, collaborate and, and, and uh, thrive on, on the complementarities uh, in our approaches. Um, we just need to uh, spend maybe a bit of time to, to think through uh, 
those complementarities and how to uh, leverage those synergies. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, um, it's a real pleasure to have met you all. Same here. Thank you for inviting us. Uh, really a pleasure and uh, we look forward to our continued collaboration and uh, exploration. Thank you. Uh -huh.